Hello and welcome to Fall Back Regrouping After Failure. This is hosted by the Distance and Online Library Instruction Committee and thank you for attending this session. My name is Ruth Monier, she, hers. I am a co-chair of the Dolls Instruction Committee section um, and I'm a learning outreach librarian at Pittsburgh State University in Kansas. My co-chair, Ella Gibson, will moder be moderating the Q&A, and our other DOLS committee members, Caitlin Belichick and Joy Hansen, will be moderating the chat. As a reminder, live transcription is available, and please use your Zoom toolbar to enact that or turn it off as you need. As a reminder, um, we will be if you would like to volunteer for DOLS, the Distance and Online Learning section, um, you are welcome to do so, and that call will go out on December 1. It, the charge of the instruction committee is creating professional development opportunities and facilitates meaningful conversations among librarians, like the event today, as well as the annual spring virtual poster session. Keep an eye out for those call for proposals. Um, However, there are many committees within DOLS as well as ACRL, from networking to research and publications and more. So keep an eye out for that volunteer link. At this time, I'd also like to take a moment uh, to thank all our committee members of the Instruction Committee for making today's event possible, as well as ACRL for hosting this webinar. Please note, um, if you are looking for the call for proposals, um, it will be our fifth annual. You can view other uh, poster sessions um, at that link provided in the chat. So today's agenda, we will only be recording the portion where our presenters and panelists are speaking. We will not be recording the Q&A portion with the panelists. Um, so please place any questions that you have during for the panelists uh, in the chat, and we'll answer that after all panelists have spoken. Uh, we will also then re-record for the last few minutes of the webinar. With that, I am going to stop sharing my screen so our first presenter can get their screen share ready um, as I introduce them. So our first presenter today is Ashley Maynard. Ashley is the founding member and editor-in-chief of the League of Awesome Librarians, an alternative professional membership and privacy-conscious social network whose inclusive and positive space supports critical dialogue, learning, and community building among library workers. She was the co-founder and program director of the Library Collective, a nonprofit organization dedicated to be useful, fun, and affordable library professional development. She curated and created the award-winning annual conference from 2014 to 2021. She serves on the faculty of New York University as the director of the Learning Lab, preparing libraries and library staff for future unknowns. She is a past recipient of the Association of College and Research Libraries Outstanding Professional Development Award, the American Library Association's John Windsor Prize, and the Library Journal's Mover and Shaker designation. Without further ado, Ashley. Thanks so much. Well, that was a, a really pompous bio, so let's take things down a notch. And I'd like to start with this warning. This presentation contains embarrassing photos like the one you're seeing right now, which is me in a cat mask and a lot of animal prints getting ready to perform as Jolene the Wildcat at an Adobe conference in 2018. And I've shared this totally on purpose. In these eight short minutes, I want to encourage you to rethink everything you think you already know about failure, and that starts with vulnerability and the willingness to show imperfection in public. It is very normal to fear failure, but it's even more normal to fail a lot. In fact, failure is the rule, not the exception, even though our Instagram and TikTok feeds might lead us to believe a little bit otherwise. The School of Life, founded by author Alain de Botton, calls this acknowledgement that we're destined to fail a philosophy of consolation. They say that, you know, when you look at the stats, it's actually easier to see and possibly accept how failure is the norm. What are your chances of earning less than $200,000 a year in the U.S.? Anybody want to take a stab? 99%. Um, the number of authors in the U.S. who can live solely off their writing, just about 500, though there are over 3.5 million books that are submitted to publishers each year. And let's say the tech world, Google, 
Well, they only hire 2.9% of their applicants. So failure is in fact very normal in many sectors of life. Another idea that I kind of like from the School of Life that I wanna to introduce to you today is the idea of religious pessimism or the concept of original sin, regardless of your religious affiliation or lack thereof, this idea of original sin is that being human means being flawed. So perfection becomes a losing battle. And I think this poetic truth is helpful. It reminds us that it's not personal failure. We haven't been singled out by the universe when we fail. It's actually a feature of the human condition. If we strip all of this from its religious bindings, brokenness is being human. And there's redemptive power in seeing life from this fresh perspective. The first failure that I can remember goes back to when I was four years old. I took a ballet class through the local Y and I loved class. I loved hamming it up in class. But when it came time for the performance, I stood frozen on stage the whole, the whole time. Like, not a single dance move was remembered. You can see the arrow pointing at me there. What about you? Do you have vivid visceral memories of your first or maybe even your most recent failure? Around the same time, I got some low marks on a report card at school and I cried so hard that I blurred the ink and I kind of like tried to erase the bad grade and make it go away. But then I felt guilty, so I wrote it back. But as you can see in the photo, my handwriting was not that great. And I wrote uh, the letter in backwards or, or the letter S backwards. So <laughs> my grade was probably deserved. Uh, why did I tell you this story instead of the, you know, impressive credentials from my bio at the start? Well, it's one thing to accept failure as normal or being human, and it's another thing to talk about failure in front of others, especially in a professional context. But I share this with you because, believe it or not, embarrassing oneself actually leads to more creativity. 2019 research from the Kellogg School has shown that teams that share embarrassing stories generate a lot more ideas, like 26% more than groups who share stories of pride. In other words, when we share failure, we're making room for creativity and innovation and risk-taking. And all these creative processes actually naturally involve failure. There's no masterpiece without a series of sketches and prototypes and failures. Failure is the process. And perhaps also failures themselves are worthy of celebration. From 2015 to 2021, I directed an international gathering of librarians called The Collective. And with that very first event, we introduced a special way of closing out the first day of the conference. And it was called Failure Confessions. We curated a series of lightning talks all about failure, followed by a wild open mic. And this was the only session of the conference where there were no notes, no photos, and no recording so that the sharing could be as real as possible. And the stories we heard were incredible. You can see the surprise gasping faces in the photo here, which is really from the conference. From a sex week bulletin board gone wrong, where a, a graduate student library worker stapled giveaway condoms onto the board, rendering them uh, highly unsafe, uh, to a tell-all confession about a new librarian mother lactating and peeing during an instruction session, we provided a safe space to show up as library workers who are fully human and to encourage one another to do the same. And as you might imagine, the session was insanely popular. We had to do it again and again. One of our volunteers for the conference, Samuel Hansen, decided to take it even further and develop a podcast interviewing some of the best confessors over the years. And there are some public episodes available now. Um, my question is, would you sign up to do this podcast? Well, let me try to convince you why we should, why we should share these failure stories and why confessing is actually a good kind of sharing. Uh, and this is a quote from the School of Life. In order to increase our chances of survival, we need to feed and massage our imaginations. We need to provide them with examples of alternative narratives so that they can grow more skilled at growing our plan Bs when fate commands. We need examples of failures so that we can pick ourselves back up and keep going. 
To take the idea of failure confessions even further, I sought permission from NYU to do something even wackier, which is take failure confessions and turn it into a three-day course on failing and make it very celebratory. Uh, and thus became Failure Camp. It happened this June where we encouraged critical engagement with the concept of failure in our work lives, but not exclusively, also in our lives lives. We experimented with new ways of failing productively together, including design thinking and prototyping approaches. We celebrated stories of failure, especially in library settings, trying to normalize that experience. And of course, we tried to help orient workers and amongst themselves and develop unique connections in this shared spirit of celebrating rather than fearing failure. Um, I think this cohort experience was successful and I wish I had time to cover all the strategies for how to use failure as a natural part of the creative process or how to cope with failure that doesn't feel creative or redeemable. Uh, but for that, I need three days. So instead, I'm just gonna leave you uh, with one major takeaway. While American culture valorizes perfection, youth, and an almost plastic-like sense of beauty, other cultures have a lot to teach us. For instance, if we look at traditional Japanese philosophy, there is a concept of wabi-sabi. It permeates many other uh, cultural aspects of life, including sculpture, floral design, and ceramics like the kintsugi or golden repair that you see in the image. Distilled down, wabi-sabi is the idea that brokenness make something beautiful. It's the cracks, the imperfections. And of course, the Japanese are not the only ones with this perspective. Rumi, the famous 13th century Persian poet, put it this way, the wound is the place the light enters you. Or Leonard Cohen, for a more contemporary reference, the famous Canadian singer, songwriter, poet, and novelist, uh, penned this musical line, ring the bells that still can ring, Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Or in super modern terms, in the HBO series Kidding, where Jim Carrey plays the character who's a mashup of Mr. Rogers and Jim Henson, a puppet says, the cracks are not evidence that we're broken, but that we've healed. So the best way to combat failure is in changing your mindset or your perspective. And I hope I've made a tiny shift in yours today. If you'd like to learn a little bit more, the link below bit.ly slash fail reads will give you some of the readings from Failure Camp. And if you'd like to connect with me to learn more about failure or to offer a failure camp, let's talk. You can reach me at librarylab at nyu.edu. Thank you so much for that, Ashley. And with that, we're gonna talk, go into our next presenter, Isabel Soto Luna. Um, she is the business librarian for the University of Nebraska Omaha Libraries. She is a bilingual information professional, educator, liaison, and communication specialist with experience in academic libraries, archives, fundraising, translating, and project management. Without further ado, Isabel. Hi, everyone. So I don't have slides for you because I have always felt that when a conversation about failure, being open, honest is gonna be the way to go. So I'm gonna actually start with a favorite quote of mine um, by Maya Angelou, and that's, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Now, the reason I'm bringing this quote up um, in this talk is because just like Ashley said, it's all, when it comes to failure, it's all about how you react to it. It's all about looking at it from a very different perspective. And I have had to learn that, especially over the last couple of years. Um, so I am going to give you actual examples of where I have failed and how that has actually turned into be one of the, the, the those failures have turned into some of the best thing um, that have happened to me and how it is that we can take those failures, turn them around and turn them into something good. Um, to start with a couple, just the beginning of last year, um, found myself having to search for a job my contract was ending. I was a visiting professor at a university in Southern Colorado, and they were getting ready to take my, the position I had there and make it a permanent position, tenure track, faculty, tenure track, the whole thing. But of course, you know, you can't put all your eggs in one basket, right? But honestly, I thought I was a shoo-in. 
I've been doing the job for two years. I've been doing that exact position for two years. I had been a work study student at this library. I got my undergrads from this particular university. Um, you know, so I thought, you know what, this is my backup. If nothing else comes up, this is my backup. This is um, where, where it's all gonna go down for me if, if nothing better comes up. And I did not get that job. I was not offered that position. Now at the moment, I'm gonna say it felt like a massive failure, felt huge. Um, but looking at it from this point now, if I were to be honest with myself, and I think that's something that we all really need to talk about what those failures are is, was that really what you wanted to happen? Was your so-called failure, what didn't happen, is that really what needed to happen? Is that really what got you into, in, is, is that really in that moment, how it needed to go and how you can take that and learn from it? Um, for me, honestly, I, I learned the hard way, you do not assume anything ever. Um, for a lot of us, you know, we, we were talking about this before everybody came in. Um, imposter syndrome is a very real thing. And so for a lot of us to feel like something is for sure and then it doesn't happen can be a huge blow. And it was a huge blow. It still kind of stings a little bit. But the reality is that that wasn't the job I wanted. And because that wasn't the job I wanted, the reality was that I wasn't the right person for that job, that they needed to pick somebody who was right for that job. And I needed to find somebody, something that was right for me. So instead of looking at it as that was a failure, I look at it more as that was, you know, it needed to happen. That was the kick in the butt I needed for something to happen and for something to be right. Um, but when we're looking at how to react to failures and, and, and how to react to in the moment things that go on, um, you know, I, I have, another story to share with you. During that same job search, final interview, and we all have to go through those final interviews and do um, a, an instruction session, sample instruction session. I had everything ready. I had set up my, my um, slides. I had my links going. I was set. And then as I was going through my presentation, I found out that two of my links were, in a, were switched in my presentation which is embarrassing because now you're looking like you're not prepared. And then I was asked, you know, during the Q&A as, you know, your students are asking you questions. I went to the long library website, to the website at the wrong, at the wrong institution. Now, these two things, I was 100% sure that I had failed that interview, that I was done. And, and it was embarrassing because normally for me, I'm neurodiverse and I am an extreme perfectionist. And I just, you know, after the interview, I, I honestly, I wanted to hide under my bed for months. But here's the thing, in that moment when something goes wrong, one of the things that I have taught myself is that number one, expect something to go wrong. And if you expect something to go wrong, instead of freezing and not doing it and, and just freaking out about it in the moment, your brain actually goes into problem solving mode. So anytime you have a presentation, you have something you need to do, you have something that could potentially, you know, anything. Um, just go through it in your head and think, okay, if this goes wrong, I can do this. If this goes wrong, I can do that. If this goes wrong, I can go here. If this goes wrong, I can go there. And I do that every time. And so in this case, because your brain is already used to saying, okay, if something goes wrong, this is what I'm gonna do, it automatically goes into problem solving mode. Automatically, without, without um, thinking about it, it goes into problem solving mode. And for me, in that moment, when I made those two mistakes, the first thing I thought of was, you know what? You're all my students. As you can see, librarians make some mistakes too. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to do something wrong, as long as we fix it and you ask for the help that you need because that's what librarians are here to do. And I'm gonna tell you, that's the job that I'm sitting in right now at UNO Libraries as a business librarian at UNO Mahat. A couple of weeks later, they called me and I am fully convinced that it is because of the way that those mistakes were handled, that those failures were handled. Now, mind you, until I got that phone call, I was beating myself up because I wanted this job. And as I said, you know, not having gotten the other job that I thought was for sure, led me to be here now. So don't think of failure as the world's going to end. 
because you don't know the way you react to those failures is going to make a huge difference. For me, I thought that interview, I was done. I thought that interview, it was never going to happen. But in that moment, because I reacted, you know, with grace, with compassion, with a little bit of style, with some humor, just like that Maya Angelou quote, things came through for me. And because I was able to hold my own, even in a situation that could have proved catastrophic for anybody else, I honestly believe that that is why they called me and I got the job. Because I was able to handle myself and not make it worse, but rather acknowledge the mistake and move on from it. And I think it's incredibly important that, you know, we don't let that imposter syndrome beat us up, that we don't let those moments in which we feel like this is about to end and my career is over, you know, that we don't let them consume us. Because when we let them consume us, that's when we freely failed. Everything else is an experience. And it's an experience that you share with your colleagues, like I'm sharing with you right now. Because as you can see, yes, massive failure in that, in that, in that space. Massive, you know, job that I had been doing for two years. I didn't get it. But final interview during that same job search process where I messed up, but I acknowledged it and I took it in stride and I used humor to deal with it. And I kept going and I kept making those connections. I got the job. So it's not always about being continuously perfect and not making mistakes. It's about learning from those mistakes, moving on from them and how you react to them. And so I wanted to share my stories, specific stories with you all today, because I think one of the many things that we often find in professional development such as this is that, you know, there's a lot of theory about why stuff happens, but we don't get to see the actual story, the actual failure and how somebody dealt with it. And so I wanted to share that with all of you um, to realize that at the end of the day, it's not as bad as you think it is. At the end of the day, you are all doing amazing work out there. And those failures that you consider failures are nothing more than experiences that you can then take, use some passion, some compassion, some style, some humor, turn them around and use them to your advantage and turn them into something good. So a little short, but thank you all. Thank you so much, Isabel, um, for those wonderful insights of how to handle. I'm going to give um, Lisa, a minute or two to go ahead and yes. start with her screen sharing um, as I introduce our next um, speaker, uh, who is Lisa Bexford, who is the head of learning and design initiatives in the teaching and learning engagement department at Virginia Tech's Newman Library. She's passionate about empowering students to achieve their educational goals and facilitates face-to-face -face and online learning experiences that help students across the university grow as researchers and scholars. She serves as a librarian for the School of Education as well as the engineering education program. She leads her department's online and instructional design initiatives, including the Odyssey Learning Object Repository. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you all so much. Uh, so my talk today is called Out of Your Hands, Dealing with a Failure That's Not Your Fault. And as you said, my name is Lisa Bexford. And if you would like to follow up, have any conversations about the things that I talk about here, I'd be happy to chat with you over email and my email address is listed there. So a little bit of background. Um, so I was hired at Virginia Tech in August, 2015. And at the time I was hired, plans were already underway to develop a space called the Learning Design Studio in a small, empty, former computer lab within the library. And the Learning Design Studio was envisioned as a place for collaborative instructional design where a small team of librarians and instructional designers could work with faculty um, from outside the library to create online learning content. And faculty could work with us on multiple levels from acting as a subject matter expert as we created the content all the way to utilizing the space to create content on their own. And you can see here some of the features of the space. Um, so the space's design included a sound booth, which you can see there on the upper left, um, a space to record lectures, including various backdrop options, which you can see on the bottom right. Um, a learning glass, which I don't have a photo of, which is a large piece of glass, kind of like a whiteboard. It's got a camera on the other side, and then there's a computer program that will flip the writing that you do on the learning glass. Um, computers with technology like Camtasia, Articulate Storyline, and the Adobe Suite, which you can see up in the right-hand side. A small collection of books, and then a conference table with a screen down there at the bottom left. 
So, and when it came to planning for the launch, so by the time I was hired, funding for the space had been approved and an architectural rendering developed, um, and the space had been cleared out so that renovations could begin. Now, the project's original visionary left the university soon after I was hired, but others took over the project, and I was brought into the planning process as well. And as a new librarian, I was especially excited to be a part of something like this. And then from August 2015, when I was hired to August 2017, our team worked to plan the studio's launch. Um, we, deciding, we were deciding on the roles each team member would play in the studio, um, creating workflows, making additional decisions about the space's design, and testing out our processes with a few clients, mostly from within the library. Uh, the space itself took shape, as you can see in the pictures from the previous screen, um, although the actual build took longer than anticipated because that's how things tend to go in academia. Uh, we created a website, we had business cards printed, we planned how our work with the studio would fit into our overall job responsibilities, and we were really planning our day-to-day -day jobs around being involved in the studio. Everything was moving forward towards an official launch sometime in fall 2017, until at the beginning of the fall semester, we learned that work on the studio was being paused, and about a month later, work was halted for good. And there's no need to go into the details here, uh, but it really boiled down to campus politics, staffing changes, and questions over what role the library should play in online learning at our university. Um, by the end of fall 2017, it was clear that the learning design studio was not going to happen, and those of us in the planning team were left feeling really rattled and disappointed um, with a really big gap in our professional lives where the studio was supposed to go. So then we had to deal with the failure, and it wasn't something that we were responsible for, um, but because we had worked so hard for almost two years, uh, the studio not launching felt like a personal failure, even though the situation was out of my control and out of my team's control. Um, one of my main goals for that year, which I had stated on my activity report at the end of the previous year, was to help launch the studio and work with faculty clients there. And then I had to explain in my next year's activity report that I had been unable to achieve that goal. As a relatively new librarian, it was hard to fail at something that had been so exciting. And at that point, it was the biggest failure of my professional career. It was also disappointing to see two years of work not come to their intended fruition. And I wondered if it had all been wasted time. So the space, however, was reborn in late spring 2018 as a media recording studio. And that is a student focused space for creative production. And the studio has been very successful as a student focused space and those of us creating online learning content are still able to use it for media production when needed, even though we were not responsible for the day to day running of that studio space. And you can see here a couple of pictures, you can see some of the same technology, most of the equipment originally purchased for the learning design studio has been incorporated into the media recording studio. And the space has been used by various student groups on campus to create some really amazing stuff. You can see there on the left hand side, uh, the, the same sound booth that we had before, uh, they do a lot of music production in there. On the right there, you can see um, the same kind of camera setup um, with some different backdrops and they've been able to do a lot of really cool stuff with that existing technology. And we are actually still accomplishing our goals uh, that we have with the original studio. We still collaborate with other library faculty and with those outside the library for online learning content creation. During the 2020 to 21 school year, uh, the space was used by faculty to produce content for classes that had transitioned online due to the pandemic. So in many ways, we are still accomplishing the original goals of the learning design studio. And in fact, not having a dedicated space has in some ways freed us up to approach projects at a different pace than we may have to otherwise if we were running a service point. And our staffing model and number of dedicated staff we have who can support this work has changed as well. And if we were still running the studio, it's difficult to know what its impact on our team would be. So as I was reflecting on this failure, a couple things came to mind. Um, one is that from a distance of five years, this failure actually seems like less of a big deal. And I think it's really easy to minimize the impact of failure as we move forward. In some ways it's probably healthy because we don't wanna dwell on the past, um, but in other ways it can cause us to disregard the impact of a failure and any emotions surrounding it. Um, the Learn Design Studio shutting down was stressful and really, really disappointing. And I think it's important to feel those feelings and not try to minimize them. Um, having felt them, you can then move past them. And the second takeaway is to recognize that whether or not the failure is your fault, it doesn't define you or your professional worth. And since this experience, I've really tried to hold new initiatives with an open hand, 
try not to fall into the trap of thinking that any one thing is going to make or break my career or be the thing that determines my worth or success as a professional. And doing so has helped to keep things in a proper perspective so that failure still hurts, but just not as much. So thank you so much. And I'll be happy to take questions during the Q&A. And if you'd like to chat with us further uh, about, about this further, please feel free to email me. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, a big thank you to Ashley, Lisa, and Isabel for starting off our discussion. I am now going to stop the recording or pause the recording here in a moment. Um, and Ella, my co-chair, will be moderating the Q&A. Please feel free to use the chat. Again, this will not so. We are back to recording. One moment for the last couple of things. Um, sorry. Rechange screens. Uh, please share your thoughts with us about um, this presentation. Uh, there should be a link in the chat for you to go ahead and fill that out. Uh, thanks in advance to Joy for putting that in. We appreciate that. Please let us know and please let us know what future things you um, want to see from us. I would also like to give a big thank you uh, to our panelists who are amazing and hopefully you take a quick moment before you leave to read the chat. There were some a lot of encouraging words uh, and the help that you have provided with your honesty and vulnerability, um, especially during the Q&A portion. I also would like to thank the Dolls Instruction Committee one more time. Without them, this would not be possible. Also, again, thank you to ACRL for hosting and providing additional tech support. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, thank you to all the attendees. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this conversation about failing and being open about it is something that tends to be lacking in our literature and our openness um, because it does require vulnerability. So thank you for being a part of this. Um, and without you, this wouldn't be possible. So um, one last virtual round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you again, Ashley, Lisa, and Isabel. Um, I'm going to now stop the recording, um, but again, thank you all.